oncologic surgeon on faculty at Cedars. And I'm going to be joined today by my partners, Dr. Seedoff and Dr. Trong, as well as our colleague, Dr. Schimler in the Family Planning Division. And we're going to be talking about gynecologic surgery during this pandemic. And on another note, um, I those for those of you who don't know, I've been in charge of the Grand Rounds curriculum for the past two years. And uh, we just appreciate your uh, continued engagement uh, through this pandemic and hope you are enjoying this virtual option, uh, which we hope to continue uh, even after this is over and we start meeting in person again. So with that, I'll get started. Here are our disclosures for the talk. And here's what we're going to be going over today. So I really want to take you through the evolution of guidelines uh, guiding us pandemic in regards to gynecologic surgery. Talk about the concern for laparoscopy in particular, um, how we should resume elective surgery, and then the push uh, for telemedicine as well. Dr. Seedoff is going to give you a primer on what we're doing at Cedars. Dr. Schimmel Seedoff is going to give you a primer on what we're doing at Cedars. Uh, Dr. Schimmler will be talking about uh, family planning changes during the pandemic, and Dr. Trong will be talking about teleeducation. So I don't know if any of you can remember all the way back to March 13th. It seems like a lifetime ago, but this was when the American College of Surgeons at the time put out their pretty um, provocative statement on uh, canceling all elective surgeries. And I remember where I was at this time, I was actually sitting in a physician wellness lecture and I saw this email come through to my phone and I wondered, wow, will, will my cases be canceled next week? And sure enough, they were. But if you remember, this was even before we had any stay at home orders or push for social distancing. So this was, I have to commend them for being a little bit ahead of their time. So what they said was that we should review all scheduled elective procedures with a plan to minimize, postpone, or cancel electively scheduled operations until we pass the predicted inflection point and can be confident that our healthcare infrastructure can support a potentially rapid and overwhelming uptick in critical patient care needs. So essentially the focus of, of this statement was that we need to preserve infrastructure, uh, including operating rooms, PPE, ventilators, uh, potentially for a large uptick in patients that would be coming in with COVID-19. And just a few days later, uh, our national organizations got together and put out a joint statement on elective surgeries as well, saying that they agreed with the American College of Surgeons statement, but they also put out the caveat um, for OBGYN procedures for which a delay would negatively affect patient health. Those procedures should not be delayed, and they wanted to make sure to include procedures related to pregnancy. And in addition to needing to preserve um, infrastructure, there was really some evidence coming out of China that operating on patients while they were sick or maybe in the prodromal phases of, of the disease was actually quite dangerous for them. Uh, this was a paper looking at 34 asymptomatic patients who were in the incubation period of COVID-19 in Wuhan. And this actually included five patients who underwent uh, C-sections during that time. All of these patients developed pneumonia on CT scan and represented to the hospital with a median of 2 to 3.5 days post-op. 44% of them required ICU admission and there was an over 20% mortality rate and some of those patients were even in their 40s. Um, so there was really this push again in, in um, needing to preserve infrastructure but also needing to take care of our patients and that if we accidentally operated on them while they were asymptomatic from the virus, it could actually be detrimental to their health. As you all probably saw, the American College of Surgeons also released a triaging system for our elective surgery, which we've largely been following here. Uh, tier four for emergency surgeries, uh, tier three for surgeries that could that would cause harm even if delayed just a couple of weeks like cancer or pregnancy termination. Tier two for surgeries that had a little wiggle room over a couple of weeks, including CVS and amnio, which are traditionally done it uh, through a range of gestational ages. And then tier one, which were most of our surgeries, surgeries for benign conditions, including fibroids, endometriosis, and pelvic organ prolapse. So after this tier system was released, all of a sudden, um, SAGES started putting out um, concerns from surgeons um, re regarding how safe performing surgery was for us and the OR staff. 
um, particularly endoscopy and laparoscopy society. Um, they were concerned about the risk of aerosolization of the virus during surgery and how that could transmit to staff in the operating room. Um, and as I mentioned, they had specific concerns over laparoscopy and pneumoperitoneum. Um, and it really got us back to this, this argument um, and discussion over whether we should be performing laparoscopic surgery or transitioning all of our surgeries to open um, procedures during this pandemic. Um, there are some leading uh, general surgeons, especially in um, who were giving some webinars for AGL and for SAGES, who said that they were transitioning all of their surgeries to laparotomy, including cholecystectomies and appendectomies. And so we know this is very morbid for patients, um, and is it even the right thing to do for us? So I wanted to go through some of the uh, knowns and unknowns as we try to navigate how we should be performing procedures during this time. We've known about aerosolization of viruses for a long time. Uh, this is a paper from the Green Journal in 1990 looking at um, patients who were undergoing surgery for HPV-related lesions uh, with a CO2 laser. And the researchers took uh, multiple swabs from 110 uh, different patients. They took swabs of the surgical instruments, of the surgeon's uh, PPE, as well as the surgeon's uh, nose, eyes, and ears, and they also filtered the smoke. Um, and they actually found HPV DNA in 60% of these swabs and areas. Um, so we've known that this that viruses can be aerosolized. Uh, luckily in that study, none of the swabs from the surgeon's uh, skin um, or nasopharyngeal area were positive, but it was found in other areas of the operating room. And then in a study from Korea in 2016, um, they wanted to know if these bloodborne viruses were actually aerosolized in pneumoperitoneum. So they took 11 patients who had known hepatitis B virus. All of these patients had undetectable viral loads going into surgery, and they filtered the pneumoperitoneum and then evaluated it. And they found the hepatitis uh, B viral RNA actually in the pneumo from 10 of the patients. So that's a little bit counterintuitive since they all had undetectable viral loads, but again, gives evidence um, that we've known these viral particles can have been aerosolized um, for a long time during surgery. And what else, what is surgical plume and, and what else do we know about it? Well, it's generated from electrosurgical devices. And as I mentioned, it does contain um, at least bloodborne viral RNA, as far as we know. We also know it contains um, portions of HIV and the hep C virus as well. But as far as we know, there's no documented increased risk of transmission to OR staff from the surgical plume. We actually don't know if the viral particles have infectivity. And there's pretty other, there's some other nasty stuff in the surgical plume as well. There was a study out of Japan where they collected 30 minutes of pneumoperitoneum from multiple patients and then analyzed it uh, with uh, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. And they found multiple chemicals in the surgical plume, which are considered dangerous by OSHA. Um, and most of these chemicals were at a negligible level um, as defined by OSHA for hazard uh, causing hazard to uh, workers, um, but actually one chemical in particular, benzene, which is found in cigarette smoke and car exhaust, was found to be in high levels in the pneumoperitoneum and was actually determined to be unaccept uh, unacceptable risk according to OSHA. So um, we should, whether we're in a pandemic or not, we probably shouldn't be breathing in uh, the sur surgical plume and the pneumoperitoneum. What can we take from past pan pandemics or flu season? So respiratory viruses may be more similar to what we're dealing with now with SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, well, we know in regards to influenza that actually no viral RNA is detected in the blood. And while there haven't been any studies on laparoscopic smoke, there does not seem to be an increased risk of transmission to surgeons during flu season. And then in prior SARS and MERS outbreak, again, there's no increased risk of transmission to surgeons um, who are operating on patients uh, during that time. And that probably makes sense because these patient, uh, these viruses are spread through respiratory um, sources and they're not uh, known to be found in peritoneum or blood. Um, but is what we're dealing with now a little bit different? Uh, we know that SARS-CoV-2 is spread through respiratory droplets. 
um, either direct human to human or from contaminated surfaces. And we also know that it's aerosolized through upper um, GI or um, intubation uh, procedures. You can see here the size of the virus is actually a little bit on the larger size. Um, but it's not only found uh, in the upper airway and respiratory tract. It's also found in the GI tract. Um, and maybe some of you have seen this study uh, also done in Wuhan where they looked at 73 hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Um, and 53% of those patients had positive viral RNA in their stool, and actually 23% of them had positive results even after their respiratory samples went negative. One of these patients underwent endoscopy and colonoscopy during their hospitalization, and in the biopsies, they could actually see the viral protein in the gastric duodenal and the rectal glandular epithelial cells. So you can see here the histology at the top, and then they stained for ACE2 uh, receptors, which do line the GI tract, and then the viral uh, nucleocapsid uh, protein also stained positive here. So we know that it's found in areas other than the respiratory tract. What about the lower genital tract? Is it found there? Um, there's another study of 35 patients out of Wuhan with COVID-19, and on these patients, they took vaginal swabs of the posterior fornix. They took a sample of exfoliated cervical cells and also an anal swab. Um, and they actually found zero positive vaginal and cervical swabs, and there was one positive anal swab. And that really makes sense because there are ACE2 receptors that line the GI tract, but they're actually not found in the vaginal and cervical epithelium. And what about aerosolization of the virus in, in general? Is it really hanging around in the air a lot longer than we initially thought? Um, this is a study published in Nature, also from Wuhan, where they took aerosols in 30 different sites in two different Wuhan hospitals. And they looked at patient areas, uh, medical staff areas uh, where workers were donning and doffing PPE, and then also venues open to the general public that had very high traffic um, such as the entry doors to the hospital and the lobby. And they looked for viral RNA concentrations uh, in these aerosols. And they actually found that in the patient area, the, the viral RNA concentrations were very low, and they chalked this up to be, um, that the fact that they had excellent ventilation uh, in these areas, except as noted um, for the patient toilet where they had no ventilation. Um, in the medical staff area, actually, the finding of viral concentration was pretty high. Um, this did decrease over time when the workers got better about sterilizing their PPE. And then in venues open to the general public, uh, they actually found very high levels of uh, viral RNA concentrations in the aerosols, probably because it was, again, high traffic but low ventilation. So the OR might actually be a safer place to be as we have excellent uh, ventilation in those areas. So there's a lot that we still don't know um, about surgery and about this virus in general. We don't know the ability of CO2 alone to aerosolize particles. Um, we don't know if what's aerosolized actually has viral infectivity or is capable of transmitting the disease to staff. Um, and then we don't know if allowing these particles to build up in pneumo is uh, more dangerous to us than the open surgical plume. So again, our national organizations got together and tried to put out a joint statement guiding us uh, in this area. And what they said overall was that we know the benefits of laparoscopic surgery to patients, um, and we don't know that open surgery is actually any more danger or any uh, safer for us than laparoscopic uh, than the laparoscopic approach. So they still recommend proceeding with a laparoscopic approach uh, when appropriate. And they provided these guidelines for how we should proceed with those surgeries. So they recommended minimizing the plume by avoiding electrosurgery as much as possible. Um, make, make use of a closed uh, smoke evacuation system or filtration system with ultra low particulate air filtration or OPO, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, they recommend not venting the pneumoperitoneum into the room, something I typically had done all the time. And they recommend using a lower abdominal pressure um, also, avoid rapid desufflation, especially with tissue extraction, and minimize your CO2 escape. And then they also recommended minimizing the blood and fluid droplet um, spray in the room. Um, they put out a few guidelines for open and vaginal procedures as well. 
Um, for these techniques, they really recommend avoiding use of electrosurgery if possible and using non electrosurgical techniques. Um, but if you do use electrosurgery, then also minimize the plume, uh, use a filter alongside of your instrument instruments and a suction device, uh, again, to minimize um, escape and uh, blood fluid and droplet spray. Many of you are familiar with their smoke evacuation systems. There are multiple different ones on the market made by multiple different manufacturers. Um, some of them come with this ultra low particulate uh, air filter, which filters down to 0.1 micron, which would be most effective for clearing uh, viral particles uh, for what we need. Um, there's also HEPA filters or high efficiency air filters, which go down to 0.3 micron, which is actually about the same um, filtration level as an N95 mask. And then you can use the suction irrigator uh, as well. But remember, a lot of these just go to a simple canister that's then vented into the room and it's actually not filtered. You can see down here uh, the different electrosurgical sources and how they aerosolize particles and to what size. And then some of you may be familiar with some of the high velocity uh, CO2 systems, uh, such as the air seal. And at first it was thought that these systems might be safer to use in laparoscopic surgery because they uh, avoid uh, venting CO2. However, the, these systems actually recirculate the air and they might actually be concentrating the viral particles uh, into higher concentrations in the pneumoperitoneum. Um, so it's recommended to at least use these with a smoke evacuation system um, as opposed to using it on the recirculation setting. So getting a little bit closer to where we are now, um, what about resuming surgery? So the American College of Surgeons put out a guideline again on April 17th um, discussing um, how we should proceed uh, with resuming surgery. So what they recommended was that there should be a sustained reduction in new COVID-19 cases in the region for at least 14 days before resuming elective surgeries, um, and that this should be authorized by health authorities. Um, they also, again, going back to that infrastructure, want to make sure that facilities are able to safely treat all patients during this crisis, that they have enough beds, PPE, and other supplies. And I really liked this point that they made um, they also pointed out, can we continue to perform uh, procedures without compromising patient safety or staff safety and well-being in some areas that might be understaffed or burned out from caring for so many COVID-19 patients? Because I think we're certainly in a different place here than a lot of other areas in the country. Um, some of you might have seen this letter to the New England Journal from a hospital executive who had to call their congressional representative to get uh, the FBI um, to, to um, avoid having them confiscate their PPE. So there have been shortages in a lot of areas, um, which I don't think we've dealt with here. And in case you didn't see, SAGE has actually put out official guidelines for how to bake your N95 at home to sterilize it. So you can bake it for, uh, for 30 minutes at 158 degrees. Again, in areas where PPE was so short that surgeons were having to take these home uh, and sterilize them themselves. And then some of you might have seen the rates of asymptomatic COVID positive patients being admitted to L&D. Um, the letter in the New England Journal of, of Medicine from Columbia Irving and New York Presbyterian that showed 13.5% of their patients coming to L&D had COVID-19 but were asymptomatic. And then a new um, article in the Gray Journal from NYU, and this goes up to mid-April, that showed that 20% of their patients being admitted to L&D were um, positive um, for COVID-19. So again, different regions are in very different situations and these guidelines being national have to apply to them uh, across the country. Um, I've also just been keeping up with some different regions and the Boston Globe has been publishing hospital numbers every week. And this is from last week and uh, you can see the hospital numbers here. Mass General had 473 COVID admissions. So again, I think we're just in a little bit of a different situation here with less community spread and certainly less sick patients coming in. Um, and we have to take this into account uh, based on the region you're in and what your resources are. So if you are going to resume surgery, how should we do it? Um, American College of Surgeons recommends that we should actually consent patients uh, that they might be exposed to COVID-19 uh, during their surgery and the potential risks related to that. 
Um, they recommend that all patients should be tested preoperatively for COVID-19, which we are doing here. Um, they recommend that only essential staff should be participating in the case and that there shouldn't be exchange of, of staff. So this begs the question, well, should we even be putting uh, trainees at risk during this time? And then they also recommend that members of the OR staff use appropriate PPE. I think they really hedged on this point here because they didn't say what that PPE should be. They didn't recommend should we all wear N95s or should we all wear surgical masks? And I think the S experts uh, really disagree on this. Um, some experts continue to say we need to treat every patient as a COVID positive patient, even if they have a negative test because of the rate of false negatives of the test. And we all need to wear N95s during surgery. And then some experts will say, why are we doing the test if we're still going to treat them as COVID-19 positive patients uh, and waste uh, you know, potentially useful PPE for other parts of the hospital, again, when they have a negative test and have been asymptomatic for the disease. So I don't think we have a cohesive recommendation for what we should be wearing in the OR at this time. And I've certainly seen uh, lots of, of different opinions out there. So to be determined. For patients who are COVID positive or, or um, unknown, um, they do recommend that that surgical equipment should actually be cleaned separately from other surgical equipment and that these patients should potentially be operated on in a different part of the hospital and um, preferably a negative pressure room. Um, and then last week, our national organizations again put out their own uh, joint statement on resuming surgery. This was from April 28th. And they recommended just that prioritization of, of patients must be fluid. Um, they want us to anticipate that there's going to be multiple peaks and troughs during this pandemic. And depending on where we are, we need to weigh the risks and benefits for patients. They actually recommended that for patients who have severe comorbidities that would require a rehab stay or skilled nursing facility afterwards should actually be delayed until this is all over, until we have a dis uh, vaccine or an effective treatment. And then they um, also said that, of course, local disease prevalence will supersede any of their recommendations. Okay, so that's where we are for surgery. That's the latest uh, guideline that's come out. And so I'm gonna take the next three slides and just talk to you a minute about um, telemedicine and what we're doing in the outpatient setting. Um, so telemedicine refers to the exchange of medical information through electronic communication. And I didn't know this, but it was previously only eligible to people who were um, in designated rural areas and they could actually not receive the service at home. So they had to actually go to a center uh, to uh, receive their telehealth service. On March 6th, uh, CMS waived most of the requirements uh, for telemedicine, making it eligible to um, patients with Medicare and making uh, in any location and to receive it from their home. And these visits are considered the same as in-person visits with the goal of paying them at the same rate. In regards to Medicaid and state health systems, California was actually the only state to enact laws to also remove these barriers to receiving telehealth. And our private payers have started to follow suit as well, which is good news for everybody and our patients. Um, SAGES and ACOG both put out recommendations for who we should be seeing by telehealth during this time. Um, and this is particularly useful for triaging patients and surgical consults um, to assess their urgency in needing further or in-person care. Um, the CMS has continued to loosen restrictions as we go along. So on, on March 17th, uh, they waived the requirement to use HIPAA compliant software. So now you can see your patients through things even like FaceTime or we like the um, Epic or Doximity dialer. They do recommend that you generally practice within state lines. Now CMS has waived interstate licensing. Um, however, final approval comes from the state that you're in and these laws continue to be very opaque. And if you are seeing patients uh, by telemedicine, you should obtain verbal consent and document it in your note. On April 30th, CMS actually further loosened uh, requirements, uh, recognizing that not all patients have access, access to technology uh, with video. And so now patients can receive audio only telephone visits, again, that are still paid at the same rates as in-person visits. 
So now I'm going to pass this off to Dr. Seedhoff, who will give you um, an update about what we're doing at Cedars in the operating room. But if you need further resources on what I've talked about, I recommend uh, saving the sages.org website. They're constantly updating their guidelines for how to manage patients that need surgery and how we should manage ourselves in the operating room to keep everybody safe. Um, and so uh, they're a great resource and I recommend heading on over there as we continue through this pandemic. So thanks very much for your attention. All right. Can everyone see my slides here? Great. Um, I will just briefly uh, talk about what uh, we've been doing at Cedars and just to remind you of some of the timeline here. Um, this all started with that ACS recommendation um, that Dr. Wright talked about on Friday the 13th. And then things happened pretty quickly here in Los Angeles and California. That Sunday, LA closed a lot of um, institutions like bars and gyms and restaurants for in-room uh, in, in restaurant dining. Um, and then early that week, it was that Monday um, that was our last day of elective surgery at Cedars. I think that was pretty consistent among uh, places across the country. Um, and we moved on Tuesday um, to only be open for emergencies uh, as well as urgent cases, which at that time um, was fairly loose, um, but uh, still we're proceeding with these urgent cases. And then of course we had the stay at home order as of uh, Thursday of that week. Um, Monday the 23rd, it uh, was obvious that this was gonna be uh, a bigger issue than maybe we initially thought and then urgent therefore um, was restricted really even for we had bleeding and anemic patients um, they were required to um, be managed hormonally um, sometimes with IV iron if necessary or even transfusion um, in order to keep them out of the operating room uh, we also had to defer some cancer cases so if those could be managed with neoadjuvant chemotherapy or it could be hormonally treatment treated um, in a cancer that wasn't likely uh, to cause uh, serious illness in the short term, then those cases would be deferred as well. And all this was around concerns around volume of PPE, exposure to the hospital for staff and for patients, um, and really just that combination of, of factors. Um, we were recommending N95 masks for the OR, although I don't think that was um, completely consistent for all surgeries. I covered a uh, uh, an emergency case, an ectopic during that time, and I was given um, an N95. Um, we were also asked to stay out of the operating room for 15 minutes after intubation, because that's uh, obviously the time of highest risk for aerosolization. Um, we had the recommendations a week later from SAGES. And then on uh, Friday, the 17th of April, um, so about a month after uh, we made our first restrictions. Um, Dr. Gortz put out a letter announcing our plan for a phased resumption of cases. Um, that was the same day that uh, the American College of Surgeons put out its roadmap for resuming elective surgery. Um, and then a few days later, we were able to go back to what we initially considered urgent. Um, so that would include um, known malignancies, uh, procedures to be uh, to rule out malignancy, so biopsies and things like that in our world, like postmenopausal bleeding that needs a hysteroscopy. Um, if they had significant progression or disease of disease or their symptoms over this time, um, and then some unusual or specific time constraints. So some of that has to do with our patients who are um, attempting pregnancy if they're advanced maternal age um, or other scheduling uh, concerns. And this was all just because. Um, it was demonstrated in our community that our numbers uh, were pretty consistent and not rapidly rising. Um, and about the same time uh, through APEC, we started doing PCR testing for all of these scheduled cases. Um, and of course, this Monday, the pavilion opened um, for outpatient elective surgery um, with a plan for triaging these based on date and urgency um, and assigning each of the available rooms um, according to service line based on uh, historical volume. Um, and just to give us kind of an anchor for what was happening at Cedars at this time. So when we first uh, restricted the ORs, this is about where we were. And then we started uh, loosening things. Um, this is about where we were. 
And you can see, of course, that our numbers were fairly consistent uh, over this time. And thankfully, recently, we've seen uh, a drop in our number of inpatient cases. Um, just to review, so, so uh, CEDARS was already considering uh, some of these smoke evacuation filtration systems, um, and there is uh, potentially a law going to be coming down the books. There are some states that require this in the operating room in California, most likely will be one of them. Um, but things that we already have, so air seal we have, um, as Dr. Wright pointed out, um, the air seal mode, which is designed to um, maximize uh, visualization actually doesn't, um, although there is a filter associated with it, um, it does concentrate uh, viral particles at or in the peritoneum. So really what you have to have is an additional smoke evacuation system. Um, air seal does make this additional system that doesn't require the air seal trocar and that does uh, provide filtration. Um, and then uh, Buffalo is a pretty inexpensive uh, system. Um, but its downside is that it doesn't filter as small of particles. So in theory, this wouldn't necessarily capture your SARS-CoV-2, um, but it does have a fairly simple system design. It's uh, inexpensive. It can attach to any trocar and then just took it up to regular wall suction rather than its own uh, smoke evacuation system. They do have a couple of devices that can be used in open surgery. Um, we also have a few of these S pilot systems in the pavilion. Uh, there are four or five of them. Um, the cost of the smoke evacuation system is fairly expensive up front, um, but the tubing isn't uh, quite as much as it is for air seal for individual cases. Um, it would have a size that would generally uh, filter out um, viruses as small as the SARS-CoV-2 and it can attach to any trocar. Um, most of you are probably used to using the Olympus system. It actually doesn't provide um, any filtration. So um, it's good for visualization potentially, but not good for um, filtering out the chemicals and potential pathogens that we might experience in laparoscopic surgery. And just to show you what some of this looks like. So this is the uh, air seal that has the filter, but this is the one that attaches just to air seal. So in air seal mode, this wouldn't provide you uh, pathogen protection. This is what you need for that. This can attach to any trocar and it's basically a closed system. So um, one of these is going to attach as your inflow to one trocar and then another will attach to another as uh, your outflow. Um, just another view of uh, what that looks like. So inflow and outflow. This is the Buffalo filter. So this attaches just to a standard suction machi machine. Um, there's a setting for how much um, uh, smoke evacuation you want. Um, and then this is what attaches to the trocar. Another view of what that looks like. Um, this is the open system, the Buffalo open system made by ConMed. Um, there are a couple of um, different devices that they have. Um, uh, this is the tubing that attaches to it. So here are the two devices um, and the tubing that attaches to it. Fairly cumbersome, um, but it does uh, provide uh, smoke evacuation in the uh, open surgery setting. And then this is that Stortz uh, S-Pilot system where this is what attaches to your trocar. Fairly simple way of adjusting uh, how much smoke evacuation you get. And then this attaches to, um, to your uh, wall suction. This is that Olympus uh, system that we're all used to seeing, but doesn't provide filtration for pathogens. That's all I have for what's happening in Cedars. Okay, great. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Schimmler next. And just want to note, we'll, we will take questions at the end. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, so I'm Natasha Schindler, one of the family planning faculty. I'm just here to talk with you about a little bit of the drama of family planning um, in the time of COVID-19. Uh, as most of you can imagine, um, restrictions on family planning have increased um, even in the time of a global pandemic. I mean, this is really related to abortion in particular. The frame of reference at baseline 
women in the U.S. Um, will have an induced abortion by the age of 45, and so that amounts to about 70,000 abortions a month um, in this country. Uh, when you add in a global pandemic, um, you can imagine um, that reproductive decision making will likely change. Uh, women's you know, interest in being pregnant um, can be altered due to their own health concerns in terms of what is it like to be biologically pregnant with COVID-19, um, in addition to their finances and ability to um, support their family going forward. Though we don't have hard data at the moment in terms of what the pandemic has done um, in terms of abortion um, demand, um, I can say anecdotally in my practice, um, particularly at Planned Parenthood um, surgical site, um, I have been definitely busier than usual um, and I've been doing an average of uh, 25 surgical procedures each day I'm there. Um, a lot of women, when I've talked to them anecdotally, have also been citing you know, financial concerns, um, as a lot of them have lost their jobs. Uh, and interestingly, this has even expanded over to my practice centers, where I've been seeing quite a few women for a medication abortion um, that are, you know, ha um, have a sort of higher level jobs and are even worried about their own um, incomes going forward. So, as many some of you may have seen um, on the news, unfortunately, you know, there's um, a lot of ramifications um, globally of what's going on with this pandemic, um, but abortion restrictions are um, still making it into the news. And unfortunately, a lot of anti-choice legislators across, across the country have been using this pandemic as a um, means to restrict abortion access. Um, a lot of these arguments, particularly in states like Texas, um, has been that abortion procedures will deplete um, PPE stores and um, could contribute to hospital admissions, thus taking away ventilators and other important supplies. Um, these arguments are clearly counter to any evidence in our field um, and any way that real medical practice actually happens. Um, but you can imagine that this um, ha would have a major impact on women um, seeking abortion during this time period. Uh, just as a qualifier for those of you that perform procedures here, um, I just want to note that we can often look like this when we're doing <laughs> abortions at Cedars, um, with gloves, of course. But um, so even in the inpatient setting, um, you know, we do often wear a lot of PPE just because it's the practice in the main operator. Um, however, only 5% of abortions are done in combined hospital or private practice settings. So 95% of abortions are done in outpatient settings. Um, and to give you an idea, uh, this is actually what I would wear <laughs> during my fellowship um, when I would do um, first trimester surgical abortions to 14 weeks um, at UC Davis in our office um, with local anesthesia. These, as you know, our surgical organizations have um, substantiated, these are not aerosolizing procedures and really the PP is just for our own risk um, sort of in terms of like blood exposure. Uh, ACOG thankfully um, has had our back and so they in combination with a multitude of subspecialty um, organizations have gone you know, publicly in direct opposition to these restrictions really early on um, supporting us and that this is an essential component of health and really the time sensitive nature of this is important um, as a lot of you know and a lot of us have our own sort of specific cutoffs um, particularly with surgical abortions and when we're comfortable doing these procedures um, even you know one to two weeks can really dramatically change um, a patient's access and experience. Um, with pretty significant consequences. Um, there really aren't any exceptions to these laws except for um, true endangerment of the life of the woman, um, which is, again, a, you know, a situation none of us want to be in. Um, and really, it's on all of us to um, keep this uh, procedure acceptable. Uh, as you can imagine, so this um, scheme shows sort of the progression of restrictions over time in the U.S. It's in the typical areas that we unfortunately um, have seen a lot of restrictions, and um, they're typically motivated by governors and state attorney generals, um, you know, in conjunction with a sort of larger ploy to um, get some of these cases to get up to the Supreme Court and to cause sort of um, more national restrictions on abortion. And thankfully, as you can see, in, um, our family planning um, um, Physician organizations, um, uh, lawyers, et cetera, have been pretty successful in uh, knocking some of these restrictions down um, over the past month. Uh, so in terms of Texas, um, folks have asked me on and off about what's going on in Texas. And to be honest with you, it um, it is like literally day to day and really hard for me to follow even. Um, so I put together this timeline to really show you what this um, sort of tennis match has been going on in Texas. So basically it started at the beginning of the pandemic with the governor um, and state attorney general um, saying like very specifically that these non-essential procedures will be banned for one month. And yes, it does include abortion and specifically to abortion. They're actually for providers, physicians, um, we're penalties such as 180 days in jail if you were to provide an abortion during this time period. Um, so a group of physicians got together with some of our um, um, legal groups and sued Texas to get an injunction against this law. Um, there's a supportive actually U.S. district judge in the area that's sort of been um, on the physician side of things that backed the doctors um, 
and was able to get abortion um, legal for one day <laughs> until the Fifth Circuit um, basically initiated this back and forth. Um, the Fifth Circuit upheld Texas's um, ability to restrict abortion procedures, saying it was within their right to do this. And so you can see there was this back and forth really um, day to day for almost a month here between this U.S. District Judge in our favor, the Fifth Circuit in favor of Texas. Um, and you can imagine if you're a doctor in the middle of all of this or a patient, um, there's no way that you can really, the effect has, um, though ultimately you know, the month um, happened, really none of us can keep track of this. And if the ramifications are you going to jail as a doctor, um, just the effect of this back and forth is enough really to prohibit it access regardless of what the actual ruling is um, on any given day. Um, so basically it took until the ban being over in terms of all elective procedures um, for whatever access is there to really open up again. Uh, you can imagine women, you know, women are gonna, um, are very resourceful when it comes to um, undesired pregnancies. And so the average distance that they would uh, need to travel um, in leaving Texas uh, increased dramatically during this time. And we actually did see that um, states nearby, um, in, like New Mexico, Colorado, really did report um, increase in patient volume um, from some of these states. Um, I actually saw a patient from Texas um, here in Los Angeles uh, that flew here for services. Um, and it is estimated uh, that, about, that about one third of women in Texas during this time period that were seeking first trimester procedures will ultimately end up needing second trimester procedures due to this month long delay in access to care. In terms of what we're doing um, in places like California for our um, surgical abortion sites, we're doing many similar um, precautions like other outpatient care, uh, really you know, limiting the type of services. So Planned Parenthood in general is uh, not doing pap smears during this time, for example. Um, we're doing screening of patients and staff, um, social distancing we're doing. Um, women uh, basically at Planned Parenthood um, can walk in day, even second trimester procedure up to a certain gestational age. And so in those women, we use mesoprostol for cervical prep um, for about roughly two hours or so. And so we actually have these women waiting in their cars <laughs> um, with mesoprostol um, uh, taking its time to activate just so that we can keep them um, socially distanced uh, and doing all sorts of other things like service um, disinfection and then monitoring our um, flow of oxygen with moderate and deep sedation. Uh, so on to some more exciting things. So I'm actually um, actually sort of looking forward to some of the ramifications that will come from this pandemic. Um, our field has mountains of research, um, even before all this happened, in terms of ways that we can improve access um, to both abortion and contraception. And so really, I think this pandemic, um, like in a lot of other fields with telemedicine, et cetera, has um, really given us the impetus to enact um, some of these things. Um, so in terms of surgical um, abortion, uh, one thing that I've um, sort of implemented in my practice uh, in the hospital-based setting where we meet women one day for a referral and then they come to the um, OR for an abortion the subsequent day is really using telemedicine for that pre initial pre-op encounter. Um, so there's actually a lot you can do with existing data. And honestly, these women don't need a physical exam because most of them are healthy. Um, so I can use the existing ultrasounds to know their dating and calculate that out for their procedure. Um, a lot of women know their blood type. And honestly, that's good enough for me um, in terms of program needs. Um, if they don't, you can also draw that in pre-op and have that resulted before they leave. So it's really pretty straightforward, actually, for those of us getting DNC referrals, um, just to talk with the woman via phone the day before and just meet them personally for the first time in the OR. Um, and actually, during my fellowship, we were doing this um, with some um, d &E procedures. So I was up in Sacramento um, for my family planning fellowship, and we had women that would come from us four to five hours away for their DD procedures. Um, so we devised a system where we would do um, telemedicine pre-op visits up to 18 weeks actually, and would prescribe them um, mesoprostol that they would place on their way into the hospital for cervical preparation. Um, so even these women undergoing DNEs um, would only need to see us really just in the OR. Um, another really exciting thing um, is in terms of medication abortion. Um, so for those of you who um, you know, aren't familiar, don't do this in your own practice, um, basically it's a set of two pills that we give women um, basically to um, induce um, uh, a pregnancy um, conclusion. So um, one of the medications, mifepristone, which um, sort of starts the process, um, is something that women do have to come for the op to the office for. Um, so Planned Parenthood um, in general uh, has actually um, tried to loosen up a lot of the other things that we do during these medication abortion visits, such that women, um, if they're coming to Planned Parenthood for a medication abortion, really just have to come and get the one mifepristone pill and can leave. 
Um, so this is actually really exciting for us. So um, Planned Parenthood has substantiated that we can um, do medication abortion through 11 weeks, actually, based on some good um, research that came up before the pandemic. Usually that's uh, 10 weeks. Um, so even just that additional week really does expand access for women. Um, they've stipulated that there's no physical exam needed, including no blood pressure management, also no ultrasound. Um, and so there are situations in which we can go um, solely by LMP for pregnancy dating, actually, um, which I'll get into. Um, and again, really opens up um, a lot for women. Um, we don't need to do any labs also, um, including RH type. Um, we actually do phone follow-up. And so really women just come in, get the mifepristone, have their medication abortion at home, and that's it. Um, so there are really wide implications for this sort of minimalistic approach um, in that 80% of all abortions in the U.S. are less than 10 weeks when they occur. And so a lot of um, women could access the service in this way. Um, our real goal in general, actually, from the perspective of our, of our field, is um, to have it such that women don't even need to come to the clinic for mifepristone. Um, but unfortunately, that is uh, challenging because of um, some existing FDA restrictions on mifepristone. Um, so again, most of us adhere to sort of the evidence of mifepristone plus mucoprostol. Um, but since mifepristone came to the U.S. in 2000, there have been um, very clearly politically motivated federal restrictions via the FDA on this medication alone, um, which is incredibly safe. Um, as some of you may know who've either tried to access mifepristone in your private practice or who don't have access to it, um, the FDA requires that individual um, providers register directly with the manufacturer of mifepristone, that that person actually dispense the drug directly Patient, women can't get it from the pharmacy. Um, so if it wasn't for these restrictions, really, we could do a, a completely no visit medication abortion. Uh, so there's been a protocol that um, was just put out this past month from our organization, sort of giving a, um, a sample of how you would do a medication abortion for women without ultrasound or pelvic exam or any um, labs. Uh, the most important thing for me, we can do this um, after the pandemic is concluded. So some uh, protocol highlights, uh, really, so if a woman was to do this, basically all you would need is a positive home pregnancy test, and then you could do her dating by LMP only, as long as she's, you know, certain uh, plus or minus one week um, and you know, meets sort of clear dating parameters based on LMP alone. Um, she would be clearly low risk for an ectopic, no medical contraindications to the medication abortion. Um, so she would come in again, unfortunately, to get the person in the office. Um, and then we would send women home um, with misoprostol and they have devised the regimens um, a little bit separately. Um, there is a small increase in failure rate as the um, gestation progresses, um, specifically beyond nine weeks. And so their protocol does give women a second regimen of misoprostol to use just to sort of really decrease risk of failure um, so that women don't have to come Come in for an aspiration. Um, phone follow-up is something that's also exciting. I was actually doing this during my fellowship pre-pandemic as well. Um, uh, at one week, basically, um, you can call women after their medication abortion to get an assessment of their symptoms, bleeding pattern, and see if their pregnancy symptoms have resolved. And then they take a test at home in four weeks after the medication abortion, and it should be negative. Um, in terms of the world of contraception, so it's this is challenging. Um, for whether it's you're talking like over-the-counter methods that, you know, getting condoms at CVS, supply chain um, issues, women losing their jobs, insurance, and then even our own um, ability to reach patients um, with our limitations in outpatient care. Um, some options that have been devised from this perspective, so women are going online um, to get things like the pill patch and vaginal ring. Um, interestingly enough, um, Medi-Cal just approved um, reimbursement for subcutaneous Depo-Provera, so that's an injection women can do at home, um, and so that expands option even uh, to Depo, which otherwise would require people to come in for an IM injection. Um, really, we should be using laws that exist in California already. Um, women can actually go right to a pharmacist to get um, hormonal contraception needed. A lot of folks don't know about that, but that is one workaround. And then um, we, um, there are laws where insurance has to supply, um, provide, um, sorry, supply one year's um, full supply of pill patcher rings. So conceivably our patients can go in and get a big bag full of pills for one year, um, which would overcome a lot of barriers. Um, Self-removal of IUDs is also something that we've been talking about um, in our field. And that is also another thing that women can um, do since LARC in particular tends to involve um, needing to see a doctor. All right, so that's all I have. Um, so I'll pass it on to Dr. Strong. And see the slides. Looks good. Okay, thank you. 
Um, well, I'm going to kind of take this on a different path here. Talked about a little bit about clinical practice. And so I'm just going to talk about how we're also, you know, even though maybe our surgical volume has decreased, but training still must go on. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about telesimulation um, in order, to, let's see if we can fast forward this. Um, in order to kind of um, bridge that gap of training, uh, surgical training, while we have less volume. Um, so definition of simulate, telesimulation actually only really came out maybe in the last few years. Um, so they defined it as a process by which telecommunication simulation resources are utilized to provide education training or assessment to learners at an off-site location. Um, and really, um, telesimulation has really only it's been around for about 10 years, but has only started to evolve and emerge um, in the last few years. Um, and of course, has been proven to be a particularly useful tool during these times. Um, but typically, the telesimulation has arised from just distance and time constraints previously and the lack of resources for expertise. So some examples are um, mostly been used abroad, like in international global purposes. So here there's a surgeon from the US who is doing FLS training for a surgeon in Africa. Um, but there's actually not a lot of data on telesimulation in gynecology particularly. Most of it has been in emergency medicine, pediatric anesthesia, and doing ultrasound, and mostly doing um, simulation, not necessarily hands on um, and a lot of it is, you know, mostly like teleeducation, which um, here are some examples of what some of the different programs have been doing in terms of educating or helping their trainees. And most of it is lecture based or video based, um, but not as much hands on based. Um, so this is just a list. This is actually on the learngynesurgery.com website, which it has summary of the different um, resources that um, uh, residency programs have been using, such as um, the Academy of Pelvic Surgery, ACOG, as well as um, UCSF actually um, came, has this GGY national curriculum, which invites faculty from different areas in the region to give lectures every day at 10 a.m. on a particular subject. Um, but it's not really focused on skills, but this is just kind of an example um, actually, some of our faculty are going to also be presenting um, during this time. So they have one every single day, which um, I think is really, really great. And they're recorded as well, so people can learn asynchronously. Um, uh, so these are just examples of more didactics, but less. Um, a lot of programs are um, trying to figure out different ways to provide continued um, skills training. Um, and there's not yet a lot published, but I know like talking with different programs that they've been trying to do different things. Um, so for us at Cedars, we um, started to do um, MIGS, MIGS Mondays, which um, just to help bridge some of the surgical simulation kind of training gaps. So the first hour we do um, a hands-on laparoscopic skills training session virtually. Second hour we do um, a Zoom-based case learning um, where we review an article or the resident presents like key learning points. And then we go over um, different cases, um, surgical cases. And then we also do video review um, for the residents where we talk through cases, surgical management, anatomy, um, and show how to approach different uh, different surgical approaches like robotics or laparoscopy, for example. Um, and then the other hour is we do the hands-on laparoscopic training. So we have figured out to um, use mobile devices in order to um, do virtual training. So here's an example of the setup. So on the left, we were actually very fortunate to have boxes donated um, to our program in order to allow residents to take these boxes into their home. Um, and so residents have been doing laparoscopic training from home um, using their phones. And um, 
I've recently been in contact with lots of programs like abroad as well. So um, I actually created a um, a box from um, just using like cardboard and stuff like that, so that other programs can use if they have a box. And it's um, exact like dimensions of the box that we're using. Um, and then, um, of course, you know the challenges you know, getting instruments and supplies as well. So um, we're fortunate because we have some supplies, but um, these are just some examples of how we created some supplies um, for different programs as well as our programs so that um, residents can use for training. Um, and this is just another example of um, things that we've created. Uh, and this is just an example of how we've been using Zoom um, in order to provide so it looks actually very clear from the camera, although some of the challenge we found um, in our learners, which I'm sure the residents can attest to is, you know, the 2D is a little bit different of depth perception and the triangulation isn't quite exactly the same. Um, but They've all managed to adapt very quickly. Um, and we can also do like peer to peer um, teaching, which I think is really great. and um, so we observe, we can observe different learners and everybody can provide, um, peer, um, observations. Um, we have found that doing smaller groups are much easier, um, virtually, especially with skills training. Um, so we've tried to do some breakout rooms to create smaller groups when there's larger number of learners. Um, and then I'm just going to fast forward just a little bit here. Uh, and then we can, and it's nice because then there's a little bit more one-to-one -one proctoring, um, and you can also obviously view multiple learners at once, um, and and then also record for future kind of review, video review and teaching. So, I think that um, with telesimulation, um, some of the benefits are are obviously that it limits um, distance time um, limit. It's cost effective and it's really set up for like multi institutional networking and collaboration. Um, and it also allows for quick dissemination of new content, um, not just medical medical education, but everything else. And uh, I think that going forward, I mean, I think tele simulation is going to be here to stay. I think, um, you know, with all the different innovations that we've seen um, in different fields and also with surgery that. Um, this is something that will continue to evolve. Um, so, thank you so much for your attention. All right, thanks so much to everyone. Uh, we'd be happy to take questions here either through the chat or please feel free to unmute and ask your question audibly. Just in case you didn't see it, Dr. Sulky asked a question in the chat about patients who are scheduled for the OR. Does APEC automatically send her for COVID testing? Uh, and they have been, so they have been arranging for patients to go through their drive through site to be COVID tested um, no more than 48 hours before the procedure, but also not same day. And then they're recommending that patients uh, stay completely isolated from the time of their testing until they arrive at the hospital for surgery. Um, you can do it in your office, but they, again, need the result back beforehand and they don't want it more than 48 hours. Okay, hey, well, I guess we um, covered everything you needed to know. Um, but uh, again, thank you for your attention and um, continue to look for these virtual meetings as we go forward and uh, stay safe until we see you all again. Thanks very much and have a good day.